All right, go back to 26 for a minute. Let's just pick up in Exodus 26 a couple of ideas. First of all, chapter 26 skips the other furnishings beyond the uh, four furnishings that we talked about. It skips into, in 26, 1 to 6, the sealing linen. And we talked about the multicolored sealing linen. So you had a white with blue with purple. What was the takeaway word from that? Majesty. You walked out and you thought, wow, what splendor and majesty belongs to our God. And you have to remember that your life was a study in brown, okay? Everything you were in was in the desert. The interesting thing about the Sinai Desert, I have to tell you, I was in the, um, the Nevio Diving Club, which was a coral reef diving club that's halfway down the Sinai. And uh, back, in, back in the day, I joined the club um, that you can't join anymore because now it's Egypt. It's now called Nueva, and they totally ruined the club. But that's another story. Um, you, you're outside, and you're looking at a study in brown and this beautiful clear water. You take your mask and go underwater, and all the colors are there. Every color of the rainbow is below the sea. But up above, it's all brown. So it's interesting how God works, you know. The Israelites are walking along in a study in brown. Had they had snorkeling gear, they could have gone out and seen every color of the rainbow in a coral reef with the most brilliant fish you've ever seen. It's the second most beautiful reef in the world after the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. This is a phenomenal place to go snorkeling. And the crazy part to me was that they evidently knew about some of the sea creatures because they used some of them in regard to making incense. They would catch certain things and use uh, distilled gels from them to make incense. But apparently they didn't really appreciate the level of the beauty. And I think part of the reason is you have to have a snorkeling gear to, or, or a mask to be able to see the colors pop. You have to ask yourself who God was creating it for. You know, for, for hundreds and literally thousands of years, nobody could see all the beautiful colors of that reef. And later on, our technology catches up. We go down and go, wow! I think it's like the stars. I think God just really likes to do the colors. and he, I think he does the artwork to please himself. And I think that that's part of the whole, the nature of the majesty and splendor of God is that he loves color and he loves texture and he loves different flavors and he loves, you know, and that's why he makes us all look different. I think that there's really a, a I think he really enjoys the differences between us. I think it's very interesting because I think the further people get from God, the less they really appreciate the differences, the more they want everyone to be the same. They talk about individuality by making you all exactly the same. And what I think is funny is God loves the differences. Be careful of the Pharisaic tendency to make all believers the same. Because obviously, I, you know, I'm having a hard time with this, but I have to accept in the kingdom of God, there are some people who like country music. I don't know why. But I have come to the conclusion that I have to open my heart to, I think it sounds like cats on a hot tin roof, but I have to open my heart. Remember that the interior, first six verses, if you don't have it, put it down. How we view God affects everything about how we view everything else. So walking in and going, oh, my God is an awesome God, changes everything. Guys, if you're not having an experience Sunday after Sunday after Sunday in worship corporately, that at some point in your year you go, wow, I have a Ziggy cartoon. You might not know Ziggy, but I have a Ziggy cartoon with Ziggy standing there watching, looking at the, the uh, Grand Canyon going, way to go, God, <laughs> you know? If, if you don't see the majesty and have your breath taken away at some point, then Monday is affected by a lack of worship on Sunday, and I think that's part of verses 1 to 6. He's got to be a, a ruler worthy of obedience. He's got to be a God worthy of worship in your eyes. And in the world's eyes, he's just not, because he hasn't done enough for them lately. You know, heavens, earth, majesty, glory, stars, not enough. I want wealth, security, and prosperity in my life now, or I won't believe in God. And that's really a very small view. Um, when we demote God in our thinking, we let ourselves off the hook from following him. That's part of the idea. Kings don't live in slums. They don't live like commoners. So you were to walk inside the tabernacle and you were to go, wow, gold gleaming walls. 
purple, blue, white with angels woven in it. Take a moment and just go, wow, I'm meeting with the king. Now, the other part of it was, you get down to verses 7, let's say 7 to 13, and you should have something about the goat hair curtains. It's referred to as the tent that was placed over the fine linen. So remember, you have the fine linen, but that's not what God sees. That's what you see. You walk in, look up, see white, purple, red, blue, uh, angels. God sees from the top several other layers. He sees goat hair. What's the significance of goat? It's one of the hata offerings in 424. It's a primary offering for sin. So covering over God, man's view is majesty. God's view is sinfulness. Sinfulness paid for. Let's call it atonement. And over top of that, what did you see in verse 14? You saw two other quick coverings. What were they? And the interesting thing is the ram skin, you would, may, you would more associate with what offering? Ram. Male animal. You, you would more put it with the alsham. So you have a chata'ah with an alsham over top of it. And this one's dyed red. So it's like active blood. It's like an active of trespass. These are people with sin. These are people with trespasses. And then stuck on top of it is tahash, which is just a, you know, plastic sheet or a covering uh, that is waterproof for the practical purpose of not ruining everything that's underneath of it. Okay? So that's really, you come back and you see this graphic picture of what I see is God's majesty as I worship. What he sees is a sinful people that need atonement and a, and a, and a violation of people that are covered over with something practical to keep them dry. In, in a very real sense, it's kind of a covering on covering on covering, but it's, it, from God's perspective, it actually makes sense in the telling of the story. Now, when you pick up 15 to 30 in, in Exodus 26, what we should do is um, we, should, we should journey over to, let me see if I can get it to where it's actually, uh, I see why I did this. I did this because in 26, 15 to 30, he continues with the, um, the veil and the screen and he's going on, to, he does the boards and sockets. And essentially what I want you to see of the boards and sockets, there's no, I'm not going to offer you some big spiritual lesson here. Let me just tell you what they look like. If you take, let's say a, um, a four by four, a f yeah. everybody know what I'm talking about? If you take a four by four, and you stand it up to about here, okay? And you put it, um, you take a, a metal plate, pound out a metal plate, and put below the metal plate, this is a pin in the ground. Essentially, this is what they look like. They were a series of metal plates with pins underneath that had sockets in them. Okay, so you take the copper and you pound them in. And I want you to imagine what you're doing is you're going to set up all around the outside you're going to set up these pins. Periodically, you're going to drop them in the ground. This is funny, this is like one of these deja vu moments. I had to do this when I was showing people how to build it. Okay, you take the pins and they're about this big. They're big plates. The plate is to steady out the, the pole, okay? So you're gonna drop the plate in the ground at a specified distance from one another. If the, across the width of it, uh, you have 75 feet, what you're gonna do is break it up, right? Now here was my problem. My problem was there were 20 this way and 10 this way. And here's the problem. Which one's this counted as? What's the corner? Is the corner of the 10 or is the corner of the 20? And I actually came to the conclusion it was neither. I actually came to the conclusion that the 20 actually starts here and that there's a corner bar. And that's why the writer doesn't tell you. Now, I, all of the pictures you'll have in Bible dictionaries, except for the rose one, which was mine, all the other ones have either the 10, 
number one and number 10 being part of the 20, or they have 12 on the outside. I couldn't make the numbers work that you had exactly 20 on each side and exactly 10 on each side without putting a corner pole. So what I did was put a corner pole. So at the top, I put another plate, then put a hook, and then put a pole between it. And did it again and again and again. Does that make sense? And then I hung my curtain along the inside, just like this. And it would have little areas where you could actually see alongside because you can't pull. I mean, you'd have to have 42 hooks here, you know? So I just put a couple of hooks here, OK? And this is a white linen that I, I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine you have almost like a, a scarf that you're kind of blowing in the wind with. You can see through it, but you see a ghosty image, OK? So what's funny about that? They're giggling about the linens around the tabernacle. I mean, seriously. <laughs> okay, so the point is that in 15 all the way down to, say, uh, verse 30, 15 to 30 is all about this, this, and this. That's what it is. So if you want to draw a picture in there, it'll look sort of like that, okay? Except for, like, better. And then... When you get down to verses 31 to the end of the chapter, what you're talking about is this, the screen. This is a very practical chapter. Somebody's got to explain how you get the screen to stand up. It's fabric, okay? So instead of like playing this all out into some vast, um, wonderful story about how it touches your life. Here's the bottom line. There's a practical section here that's got to tell you how to make the thing stand up. And that's what this is, okay? Move on now. And I'm going to take and treat lightly the back end of this because much of the um, next few chapters is a redux of things you've already heard from earlier chapters. He goes back and repeats. However, I want to talk about the foreman, the priests. And you know that you should write next to 29, 1 to 46, you should write next to it what chapters in Leviticus that deal with priests off the top of your head. 8 to 10. And Luke is the man. Okay. There are, um, there are four things I want to tell you about chapter 29. The first one is, I'm going to use D and P, okay? I'm going to use D and P, right? There is a deliberate perspective in verse 1 to shaping servant leaders. A deliberate perspective to shaping servant leaders. That's going to be verse 1. Then from verse 2 to 25, there is a defined process. Deliberate perspective, defined process. Then in verses 38 to 42, there are distinct products of servant leaders. Distinct products. Things that, they, that you can tell they are servant leaders because. If you go to 43 to 46, there are divine promises. And you're asking, what happened to the ones I skipped? Let's do deliberate perspective. Somebody read verse 1 out loud. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull and bring him to the top one. All right. The beginning of it is what I'm looking at. This is what you will do to consecrate them. That is, there's a process by which God separated people to be priests, but there's a process by which leaders separated the people God separated to be priests. Now, that might have been too fast. Let's say God calls Rebecca to be a missionary. She may know that, but the church hasn't separated her out to be one. There's a second process. The first one is God calling. The second one is the leaders acknowledging God's call in her life. So, in the priests, God called them to be priests. By the way, how did he call the priests to be priests? They were born that way, okay? And your calling is wrapped up not in your first birth, but in your new birth. Theirs was wrapped up in their first birth. Their physical birth is what gave them their position. Your new birth is what gives you yours. 
What did they get at their physical birth? They got a name. What did you get? You got a spiritual gift. And that's what's going to define your call. Your call of Jesus in your life, student, is based on your gifting. God will not call you to do the opposite of your gifting. Not as your main call. He may call you on a day to do something that's, not outside, that's well outside of your gifting. But the main call of your life will be about your gifting. So when you say, how do I know what God wants me to do? I'm going to start off with, what are your gifts? Because if you don't know that, you don't even know the right question. So start with your gifting because that leads you to your call. Now, there's a deliberate perspective. The next thing is there's a, div, uh, there's a defined process. And the defined process that you have starts in 29. It's actually in 1B. And I think it goes to verse 25, if I'm not mistaken. 25 and then 35 to 37. Again, it picks up in 35 to 37. These are all about process. These are all about how you get from A to B. So here's the thing, you do, here's the thing you're looking for. The bulk of the passage is about making a servant leader. So I would probably write next to verses 2 to 25, making a servant leader. And what do you do? What do you do to make a servant leader? Well, in the beginning, verse 1, the end of verse 1, one young bull, two rams without blemish. It begins when the leadership acknowledges the call of the person publicly. Now, how did they do that? They publicly did it by a sacrifice. They held a service in which they said, Rebecca has been called to be a missionary. Now, they killed some bulls, and I'm not asking you to do that, but I, maybe they have a barbecue in which they said, Rebecca has been called to be a missionary. And then they have, you know, but I want you to walk away from it that if you want people to grab ministries, you have to listen to the call they believe God is giving them, and then you need to place on, you, on their, their uh, shoulders the understanding that all of you agree that that's what they're called to do. It's, it's necessary for the church to acknowledge what the call of the believer is. The second thing that I see is that the process moves ahead when the servant leader's individual preparations are established. What, what is the servant leader supposed to be doing themselves? Okay, so the group gets together and acknowledges them. In this case, it's a sacrifice. But look at verse 4. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of the meeting and wash them with water. What's that? There's cleansing, but there's also inspection. I do see that I get to lean into somebody who says, I feel publicly called to do something. In other words, you raise the level of what you think you're going to be in leadership, and that's going to raise the eyes of other leaders to watch you to be accountable. That's what's going on here. So he's standing there getting a bath in front of everyone. Hello? That's a little embarrassing, a little exposing. I don't mean he's standing there naked, but you know what I'm saying. The point is that to aspire to lead is to influence other people. And God isn't interested in you spreading your dirt and disease to everyone else. So he wants you to get it cleaned up first, and he wants other leaders to be involved in the cleaning process. If you don't want to be inspected, don't declare yourself a leader of anything. But if you raise up to be a leader in something, and you feel God is calling you to do it, and God has told you to do it, then I would encourage you to make it known to other leaders so that they can also be involved in the cleanliness and inspection part. All right. When, when they're qualified to join the ranks of servant leaders, they actually begin to fitting into their role. Now, the fitting in, I'm using a little play on words here, but the next thing they have to do in verses 5 through 9 is dress them. So fitting in, get it? Oh, never mind. So tunic in verse 5, robe, ephod, breastplate, um, in turban, verse 6, holy crown, and then gird them with ashes, Aaron and his son. Bind caps on them. They shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute. He says, I want you to do something. I want you to stamp on them the amount of value they have to me by dressing them up and saying these are holy to the Lord. They have to be publicly acknowledged as well as privately prepared. One of the things that's going on, and by the way, this isn't small. This, one, this is happening. We've got a lot of people who want to be in a ministry, but they don't want to be under anyone. So they go create a ministry in which no one around them has any accountability structure built in. If, if you get called to be involved in a ministry and the people who had it have no connection or accountability to anyone else, walk away. 
Find one where people are accountable. Because you don't want to be involved in movements where people don't have accountability structures. I have around me a group of guys to whom I'm accountable. But the other side of that is I also have blockers. And it works both ways, right? I, I, I spend time with these guys and enjoy them, and they correct me. Don't get the idea that I like run around and I like tell Matt what to do. That's not really how it works around here. I think what's interesting is in verse 7, they shall take anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. What is that? They're, they're pour, pouring oil over the man. By the way, the oil is perfumed. You smell like a priest. But not only that, they're, they're doing this because they need to establish in, some, in the person that they're publicly acknowledging that this is God's person and they want everyone to know. And then you go to verses 10, oh, down to maybe 10 to 14. And here's where they lay their hands on the head of a bull in verse 10. What's that about? You know about this. Okay, here's the man who's going to be your priest, but he's standing there saying, I'm a sinner. Why is that important? I don't want people leading me who don't have all the problems I have. I, I want people leading me who are real. Guys, to be, a, to be a leader spiritually, you don't have to come off as perfect. That's terrible. Who ever told anybody that anybody around here was perfect? All you have to do is know us to know that we're not, okay? And, and the thing is, you have to get to the place where it's okay with you that not everybody see only your best side. There are times when that's just not going to happen. When your heart breaks over some situation, and i got to tell you, so, something will pop out of your mouth, and you will regret it terribly, and you will go, man, guys, I need you to, I need you to forgive me. I, have just, I really blew it on that one. Servant leaders have to recognize what people have given for them and I think what's interesting is look at verse 15 to 18. Look at what happens. You shall take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and they'll slaughter the ram. And now you're going back to what? What, what is this reminiscent of? Where else have you seen this? Carrot, kill a bull, bull, then kill a ram, then kill another ram. This is an exact replay of Leviticus 8. So you might put it next to 29.15, Leviticus 8. This is the Milloween. He's talking about killing each of the rams. And look at verse 19, 20, 21. This is the Milloween. This is your right earlobe, your right thumb, right toe. This is the Milloween again. Now here's what I want you to see. Two things I want you to take away. In 15 to 18, whose ram are you killing? Whose bull did you kill? Whose second ram did you kill? Other people's. In other words, you only get to be where you are because other people pay the bill. The fact of the matter is, nobody gets to be a Christian leader without a lot of other people suffering because of their growth. Notice in 19 to 21, we, we talked about this. Ears, hands, feet. Let me say it this way. Servant leaders have to, to lay aside the common rights of other people. You don't have the rights. If you would be a priest and a servant leader of God, you don't have the rights to go where you want, do what you want, think what you want, hear what you want, read what you want, spend time the way you want to spend it with the people you want to spend it with. Your job is to follow God and stay in the constraints that he made for a servant leader. You don't get to choose, but don't feel like it's heavy. It's Jesus. It's not heavy. It is wonderful because the people he does give you to spend time with Get down to verses 22 to 25. Servant leaders give the best of all that is put in their hands to the Lord for holy use. Look, look at what it says in 22. Take the fat of the ram, fat tail, fat that covers the entrails, and the lobe of the liver. Yum. Two kidneys and fat, and the right thigh that is for the ram of ordination. You, get, you take this right thigh... And it says, and one cake of bread, and uh, one cake mixed with oil, and one wafer from the basket of unleavened bread. This is deep and wonderful stuff. What we're doing here is a luscious barbecue. And you shall put all these things in the hands of Aaron in the hands of his sons. And he shall wave them as a wave offering. And you shall take them from their hands and offer them up in smoke. Put them on the fire. Here's the thing I want you to remember. They're taking some of the juiciest, richest parts 
of the animal, some of the parts that were used for all kinds of things in, their, in the ancient culture, and they're throwing them on there and having them burned up. Why? Because the best of everything you have, you place in the Lord's hands. That's part of what a servant does. And what I think is interesting is go down to 35 to 37 for a second. And you drop your eyes down there and it says, it says, uh, thus you shall do to Aaron and his sons. For how long in verse 35? Seven days. Seven days. Make a note next to verse 35. It takes time. It takes time. What takes time? Both separation from the world and consecration to God takes time. You've got to get them out of the world clean and you've got to get them dedicated to God and it's going to take time to do it. Leaders need to learn not to follow the crowd to make their decisions. This is the problem we're having in the body politic right now. We have people that are leading us by polls. Christians don't lead by polls. They lead by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. One of the problems we have is that we have a lot of people that are chasing their own tail. They read a book about how somebody else did something in ministry and then they try to make their whole ministry look like that. You're not Francis Chan. You're not Willow Creek. This is Sebring. It's not like any other place. And what God is going to do here has to be based on what God speaks through his word and his leaders. And, and, and you have to be okay with that. You want to be somewhere else? Then go there. But, but don't expect God to do it in a franchised way. Here's what I want you to see. Seven days. Seven days. Consecrate yourself seven days. It's going to take time. You got to get away from all the noise of the world. You got to focus on what God has called you to do. Now, that's the process. Let's take a look for a moment at the distinct products. What happens? Uh-oh, I did it in a different color. That's going to bother somebody. The distinct products that come from it are in 38 to 42. Can somebody pick out in 29, 38 to 42? You shall offer on the altar to your old land continuously. 39, morning and twilight. 40, one-tenth of fine flour, one-fourth of, of oil, one-fourth of wine. And then go all the way to verse 42, because here's where the punch is. It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meeting, where I will meet you to speak to you there. What is the distinct product? Yeah. God will make sure you're clear on what he expects. When people walk around for years of their life saying, I just don't know what the will of God is for me, something else is wrong. Because here's the thing. God really wants you to know. Can, can, I, can I stop and impress that on you? God does not want to play cat and mouse games with you for the rest of your life going, here I am. No, I'm not. I'm over here. He's not doing the little, you know, nuts under the cup thing. Try to figure out which is actually your future. That he's not doing that. The problem is we don't want to do the things that get us to the consecrated point where he can talk. We want him to talk over top of our sin. He doesn't. We're going to have to stop and go, wait. I, I really want to hear from you, so I'm going to step away from all this stuff in my life, and I'm just going to, I really want you to speak to me. I don't know if you ever have times with God that are that demanding, but God is not afraid of them. God, I need you to talk to me about this. Then open his word and let him speak. Because here's what I think you're going to find. He's not trying to hide from you. I think there's an awful lot of Christians who swear in their heart God is trying to hide. He's just, he's not speaking to me anything. No, he is. You're not listening. Let me, let me also go back and just close this off with divine promises. Do I have to write that one down or can we all get two words? Divine promises. And this I'm going from 26 to 34 and 43 to 46. 26 to 34, 43 to 46. There's two different promises and there are two different sets of promises. Promise number one is to provide and that's 26 to 34, to provide for you. If you will be a servant leader, I will provide for you. Where do I get that? Don't just write it next to 26 to 34. Check me and see if it's actually there. Come on, I might be lying to you, setting you up with all sorts of false doctrines so that I can do what? I don't know, but if I could think of it, I would say it. Okay, what, how do I get the idea Verse 26, pick it out. It will be your portion. Underline, it will be your portion. God will provide for you if you will serve him. 
servant leaders understand that God has a way to take care of you. Now, does that mean you have to be unintelligent about it? No. I encourage everybody here on the staff to have something on the side that they do besides ministry. Another way to make money. Just because I found that God really, there's so, some contacts you make in the business world that you can't make as a pastor. As soon as people hear I'm a pastor, they expect me to say certain things. They, they kind of discount my, my whole thought because, oh, you're going to be like a religious guy. You know, and, and I think every other Christian is going to be one too, but don't tell them because they'll shut everybody down. So my thing is if you have other ways people meet you. What's funny is um, to some people, I, I think there's an awful lot of people I go out and speak to that don't actually know that I pastor anywhere. A lot of them know I'm a Bible teacher and many of them know that I do archaeology and history and some of them know me in different contexts, but I don't walk around going, pastor, pastor, because I found that that kills conversation. As soon as you say you're a pastor, people stop talking. And I, I want to know people. I want to know what's going on in their lives. I think that you get to the place where you understand that when the Lord, if you will separate yourself to be a servant of his, he will, he will make sure that you have a way to do it. But don't be unintelligent about it. Have some other things in your life so that he's able to use many, you know, you cast your bread on many waters because you don't know which one's going to come back. Don't put all your investments in one basket. Put them in different places. And, and that's people investments, discipleship investments, that's energy investments, put it into many things. All right, what's the second one? Can somebody pick out verse 43 to 46? What's the second provision God says he'll make? He'll be with them. Yeah, presence. Presence. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to provide for the people of God by being there. So I'm not only going to provide for the leaders, I'm also going to provide for the people. Okay? Questions about chapter 29. I want to do chapter 30 in fragrance, and then I'm going to skip, um, because really, you're going to get into repetition now. You're going to have, again, the table showbread, again, the brazen altar, again, the menorah, again, okay? So what's important is chapter 30 really deals with something that I think is, is, is um, a very cool way of looking at what God is doing. Let's go to the fragrances. Let's do, um, in chapter 30, let's see, how did I, how should I do this? I want you to go to the middle of chapter 30, let's say 30 verse 22. Let's pick it up there. Because I've, I've got to push you through this and I know the best way to do that is to, is to focus on what we're focusing on. Here are the fragrances, okay? There are two smells of the tabernacle. One of them is anointing oil, and the other one is incense. So somewhere next to verses 22 and following, you want two smells, incense and anointing oil. And both of them have something to do with what God is saying. So 22 to 33 is the smell that goes out, meaning the perfume of God's holy ones, what God's people smell like. Now, take a look at it. It says, you know what? You can almost smell this when you're reading the passage. If, you're, if you read the passage, just kind of go, hmm, I think I know what that is. It's, um, take for yourselves, verse 23, the finest of spices, circle myrrh, cinnamon, fragrant cane, cassia, and olive oil. Make of these a holy anointing oil. I forgot to bring mine. I think it's out in the car. Um, there is, there's a mixture of this that I have, so I'll pass it around to you so you can smell it. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a neat little, we don't know the exact way to make it, we know sort of the way to make it. Um, there might actually be one back there, because sometimes we use it if somebody comes forward uh, at the end of a service for anointing. At any rate, um, so th there's the mixture, and then it says in verse 26, anoint the tent, anoint the ark, anoint the table, Anoint the utensils, the lampstand, uh, altar of incense, altar of burnt offering, utensils, laver, and stand. In other words, all the furniture gets oil put on it. When you anoint it, what do you do? You don't pick it up and lower it in a vat of the stuff. It's just you put it on there and you sprinkle it on there. So there's a sprinkling of this smell on all the furniture. And in fact, when they're clean and polished, you rub that smell into the furniture. So this, 
Guys, when you go down the street in Jerusalem, there's a place in the old city and I, that used to be a spice market for 500 years. There hasn't been spices in it in over 150 years, but it still smells like a spice market. That stuff permeates the walls. It's, 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 in the, it's in the stone. It's everywhere. You walk down that street. There's another street, by the way, that's where they kill all the animals. That one smells too, but not quite as nice as the other one. At any rate, you walk down the street and you can just smell it. It's there. It's in the air. This is, when you come to the tabernacle, the whole place has a smell. How many of you, um, how many of you go home and there's a certain smell of home? There's a certain, you know, my, my mom baked. She used to bake all the time. The ho my house always smelled like something baking, which is the reason I eat baked goods continually. I, you know, I actually, have you ever gone into, how many of you like candle shops? Did you ever go in and smell these candles that are like, like, like for baked goods? See, if I put that candle on the table and light it, what am I going to do all day? Eat. I'm going to eat or think about eating all day long. That's just wrong. Those candles should be outlawed and not allowed to be sold. There are some things, though. Did, did you know that smells actually are a better memory device for you than hearing or seeing even? A smell can bring back a memory. Does anybody have one where you got, you don't have to tell us what it is, but you just, you smell it and your mind goes back to that place. It's funny because whenever I smell diesel fuel and rosemary, it's West Jerusalem. Because buses have, have the smell of burned diesel and rosemary grows all over West Jerusalem. The, that mixture puts me in Jerusalem. I could just... If a bus goes by and I'm holding rosemary, I could put my mind, right? And I can tell, it's, I'm there. It's, it's funny, but your mind does that. Why do you suppose God said, put all this, um, I was going to say stinky, put all this aroma-filled oil on the pieces of the tabernacle? Yeah, and even before that. Think about it. The, tra the tabernacle is being transported through the wilderness. And people downwind of the tabernacle know where it is. Um, they actually had this distinct aroma. In other words, worship smelled like something. The place of worship smelled like something. By the way, what do people use oil for in the Bible? Okay, but why? I mean, besides, yes, that's true. They use it in this consecration and anointing, and that's one way. But what do they use? What's the oil used for daily? What's that? Cooking. cooking is definitely going to be on the list. Yes. So we got anointing and cooking. That's what, what we got? Light. Okay. The, the electric company of the Bible is your olive oil salesman because that's what you burn for, uh, for uh, lights. So now I've got lighting, consecrating, cooking. What else? What's that? Yeah, they really did more of a cleaning than a deodorant. Deodorant is a relatively recent thing. Um, <laughs> But the thing is, you have to remember that they're traveling with sheep and they all smell just like them. So uh, the interesting thing is, the, who were the people that smelled different than them? Priests. Priests. What I think is interesting is that, that, that they smelled like where they worked. So they worked at worship, but they smelled like it. I have some friends who are incredible worshipers. They just are. Roy Kendall's one of them. He's a great friend of mine. And uh, Roy, every time I, I spend time with Roy, he is goofy. I mean, he's like Three Stooges goofy. Him and Dottie, bad combination. But the thing about him is he's a great worshiper. And he walks with the fragrance of worship. And I don't know another way to say that other than to say it and just kind of in that weird sort of way. Um, one of the things he wanted them to do is he wanted the, them to put also another smell in the tabernacle. Go down to verses 34 to 38. What's the other smell? Beside the one that goes out to other people, this is the one that goes up. This is the smell that goes up, the incense that God smelled. So notice that the worship center had a horizontal changing aspect, a smell that goes outward, but it had a vertical changing aspect or a smell that God smelled. Now, I want to take some time and I want to see if I can show you what this is because you want to write next to verses 34 to 38, you want to write Luke 1, 8 through 10. 
This is when Zacharias goes in to make this very incense. What is the incense that he made? Look at verse, uh, verses 34 and 35. And someone give me the recipe. I got to erase this. Someone give me the recipe for um, incense. Okay, but they're more specifically designated in the passage. Okay, um, I'm supposed to put in what? Stack tay. What's that? Anika. Anika. Galbanum. Frankincense and bind it together. How? Equal parts. Equal parts. So one part to one part to one part to one part to and what's else? What else is there? There's something else. Salted. Bound together with salt. Now, let me give you some Hebrew words for these, and then I want to tell you about what the story is behind the story. Okay? First, uh, stakte is the word nataf. Anika is shechelet. Galbanum is very similar. It's actually chalbanum. And um, frankincense is levona. Melech, salt. Okay. I want to take apart where these come from. What does the incense represent? What is it to God? It's the prayer that people smell. And for that, you can put down Luke 1, 8 through 10, and you'll see that the time of prayer is the time of the incense offering. It's the same time. By the way, in the temple, what you did was you bound together all the incense, and then how did they know when the uh, priest put the altar of incense and lit the incense on fire? Well, people right there could smell it, but I mean, if you're half, a town, half the town away, how would you know? How do you know when to be praying? There's a big clapper outside. There's a big brass pan that is kind of anchored to the side of a, uh, a, a um, marble slab, and they drop it. Smash! And it was like a gong they could hear everywhere, and that's how they would know the prayers were now being offered. So if you were doing anything else, you'd stop and pray right then, because that's when God is listening to the prayers. Now, Today, when you go to, to Jerusalem, you'll find that five times a day, there's a Muslim call to prayer. That tradition preceded Islam in Judaism. There was a time for prayer, the times of prayer. It doesn't mean you didn't pray continuously. It meant that was a special time where you stopped and everybody was praying at the same time. That was the idea. Okay. Each of these comes from a specific place. So if you'll work with me on this, I think I can help this have some meaning for you. First of all, nataf, or stakte, is a bitter gum resin that oozes. Have you ever climbed a pine tree and gotten pine sap on you? Well, here's the thing. You get nataf from a certain kind of tree that grows all over the wilderness, but it oozes right out on the, on the, onto the um, bark, and you just pick it off, but it gets on your fingers. It's very hard to clean off. Um, so this was something, part of the incense was collected that just simply oozed right out of the tree by itself, okay? So I want you to use nataf, but I also want you to use shechelet. Shechelet, there's a closing flap of a gill on a fish, and it has a special gland that is also found in some shellfish. Now shellfish are found where? In the water. Where in the water? At the bottom. At the bottom. So you've got to go all the way to the bottom. And some bottom feeding fish have a gill with a gland that has it. And some shellfish have it. But it comes from deep places. The third thing that you're to put in equal measure, the word chalbanam, chelev, is the word for fat. Like as in, not, not as in being fat, that's kaved. 
This is the word for fat, like, oh, cut the fat off my meat. It's the actual rubbery fat itself. That's chelet. And um, it also comes from a word that literally means to be drawn out. How do you get maple syrup? You, you literally pound into the tree a, um, a pipe, and then as the sap comes down the tree to withdraw the sap at a specific time of year toward the autumn, out, you wound the tree, right? So this is actually something you bore or wound the tree to get. I'm going somewhere with this. Hang in there with me. Now, frankincense comes from a Botswilia tree. It's called Levana. Remember, Levon equals white. Remember I told you that whenever you put le uh, Levana or frankincense on a fire, it turns it white. It's white smoke. So when they get a new pope, they throw it on the fire, and it comes out the chimney of the Sistine Chapel, and they say, Papa has been chosen, and everybody claps. Th this is frankincense, or Lavona, and it changes the fire. Its major thing is it changes the fire. Or literally, the smoke color. So the rabbis taught that there were four different elements that were bound together with salt and they represented prayer. Do you see them? Some prayer is just sitting, it oozes out to the surface. It's the natural thing. Some of it comes from the deep places. Some of it comes from the boring or wounds of the heart, and all of it changes the color of what's happening. That's the idea of the prayer. It's kind of a cute little way to remember what's going on, um, but it's a rabbinic way of understanding what is the prayer. And all of it is bound together with salt. What is salt? It's a preservative and something else. OK, preservative, flavoring. Third one. If you look very closely, if you go to Milan and you go to see a chapel that has the Last Supper, and you look on the table of the Last Supper, the salt shaker is spilled. Why? Yeah, it's a symbol of loyalty. And in the ancient world, Judas had left, so the salt shaker was spilled. And you're supposed to know that there is a loyalty statement in salt. We're going to come back and deal with that because there is a salt covenant that we deal with in Numbers. But the important thing for you to know is that these three things are all part of salt, right? In the Middle Eastern mind, they salt the hands of a couple in the Sinai before they bind them together at their wedding. Because if you want to say in Arabic, we have a good relationship, we're loyal to one another, you say there's salt between us. It is the salt that binds the two together. This is binding salt. It is bound with salt. So it's about primarily that. So, in other words, all of it is loyal speech, some from the surface, some from deep places, some from wounds, and all of it makes a difference.